And I'll tell you guys since we're, since we're all friends. Every character I write has a piece of me in them. Hi, I'm Lee Bardugo. You're listening to The Grisha Cast. Welcome to Grisha Cast, episode 132. In this episode, we will be having a conversation with the one and only Lee Bardugo. This is your host, Eric. And I'm Terry from Nashville, Tennessee. This is your podcast for all things Grishaverse. A world created by the one and only Lee Bardugo. Moi savienyi casters. We're a little hyped up on caffeine and excitement. A little bit. So, yeah, sorry. Almost forgot to say my name. But, hey, we got it. Anyways, I mean, we really don't even have anything else to say because we just need to get straight to it. Don't you think, girl? Yep, let's get to it. Okay. So, without further ado, we are going to introduce you to our interview. Woohoo! Enjoy. Moi savienyi, Lee. We are so... <laughs> We're so excited you're here. I'm very excited to be here and to be greeted thusly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, oh my gosh, it's been a while. Yes, I know. I know. We, I lived in a completely different place last time we talked. It was, uh, was it during the pandemic or pre-pandemic that we chatted? Middle of the pandemic. Because like, it was meaning. just before Rule of Wolves. Yes. Because you couldn't, okay, yeah. you couldn't give us the title. We were trying to get the title from you. And <laughs> you t- were saying, I don't even speak the title because I'm scared I'm going to give it away. That is, was very true. It is also a very difficult title to say. Like, rule of wolves. Rural juror is what I always think when I say rule of wolves. You were also a, not a married woman, so congratulations on that. Oh, I'm amazed you even spoke to me as I was not a, a married woman, but yes, I am married now. Mazel tov. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. Oh, oh and um, Lives of Saints hadn't come out yet. I was... Yes. Yes. Oh, so... That was a big that book is forever going to be for me. I wrote that book almost entirely on set. Um, obviously, I revised it in other places, but I will forever associate it with sitting in a dark tent, <laughs> like a pitch black tent with my headphones on, like writing by the light of my laptop um, on set in Budapest, which is not a bad memory to have, but it is a weird one to associate with that particular book. Wow. That's amazing. And I loved how it it came out. I love that it's actually like just like a little part of the show as well. Um, yeah, it's gonna make quite an appearance in season two, ooh. too. In very exciting ways. So the the writers definitely uh definitely went to the full Grishaverse canon and we're like, we're gonna just play havoc with this and in a good way. In a good way. That's awesome. That's fun. Yeah, that's really exciting. So yeah, that's so great. So well, it is. NaNoWriMo. Mm. Are you participating? Ish. Um, I am not a 1,500 words a day person. That's a lot. It it is a lot. And I tend to work um, sort of in like... Uh, spurts of a week or two and then I need a few days off and that kind of thing that said I am working on a brand new book in a brand new world um not a not an addition to a series and um yeah I'm trying to crack away on that with the the NaNoWriMo energy oh wow that's exciting I am both excited and nervous which I think if are you guys writers I can't remember Uh, like um trying to be but I'm in grad school too so um, I'm writing like 1500 words a day but it's strictly for grad school (laughs) purposes I will tell you when I I used to write movie trailers for a living and I found it very hard to write um at the end of the day because it was like that muscle was completely fatigued and it wasn't until I switched careers and was doing something that had nothing to do with writing that I was able to sort of write in the evenings because I had been thinking about story all day and it was sort of building up so I feel you that is that is a challenging one yeah my hands uh, are just like done (laughs) like I can't type anymore (laughs) I definitely understand that um yeah I 
I saw this great clip with David Bowie the other day where he was talking about how I, I'm going to post it um, when I do begin as you mean to go on. I do writing sprints on January 1st every year and um, on Instagram and I I'll post it then. But he was talking about how when you wade out into the ocean and your toes barely touch the bottom, that that's the feeling you want to have when you're creating something. And that really hit with me because I I feel like with every new book, I'm like, okay, like you don't think about it consciously, but you are setting a new challenge for yourself. And there's a moment where you're like, why did I do this? I know how to do the other thing. I've done the other thing. Why don't I just keep doing the other thing? Um, but you do it because you're drawn to, right? Like, because you, you, you need to know where the story goes. So um, that is definitely the state I am in right now. My toes are barely touching the bottom. That's so exciting. Yeah, one of my favorite songwriters said um, that nobody is special in the way that they feel. If there is a feeling, everyone has already had it. But those <laughs> people who can express the feelings for other people have a responsibility to do so. So that's always kind of struck with me. I oh that that I think is very true and I'm actually reading a book for a friend for a critique right now and she's such an amazing writer and she has these turns of phrase that I just sort of sit back and gasp and say like oh god why why can't I be like this like she's so so gifted and so like like just even in the way she'll describe a color with a single word like it's not some long elaborate metaphor it's just she chooses an unexpected turn of phrase and that just always thrills me. That's magical. Yeah. It is. I'm more of a reader. I, I do try to write, but I, I love just reading stuff. So reading, we reading is blessings too. <laughs> reading is wonderful too. So we should probably get started on, you know, what we are here for. And that is, well, one, you, of course, we're very excited. <laughs> but Demon in the Wood graphic novel. Yay! Yay! So, I see that you are dressed as one of my characters, uh, Sylvie. Yes. I am. Um, oh. Yep. For those of you watching, you better watch because I didn't get all up in this gig just for... <laughs> <whew>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, but this is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, this was just, one, it surprised me so much when I heard that this was coming out. Um, and so one question is, why did you want to turn this story into a graphic novel? Like, is it like this specific one? So I think that, so the Darkling, I think is, there's no question is um, probably one of the most popular characters I've written, but also probably the most controversial, the one most likely to result in um, heated back and forth online uh, and perhaps in person. I don't know. Um, but for me, uh, there was, you know, I wrote this story, this short story, um, when we were about to release Ruin and Rising, and where he had sort of moved away from being um, somebody who was arguably uh, simply an antagonist into really villain territory. And I thought it was important to um, not explain his behavior, because I don't think it offers an explanation or an excuse, but I think it does offer context for the choices that he makes. Um, I am not interested in villains or antagonists who are not sympathetic or who we cannot on some level um, identify with. I think if we do this right, the author does the job right, there should be a moment when you're reading when you think, well, maybe they have a point. Um, and Obviously, there are there are certain characters in the Grishaverse who may be <laughs> thinking of the king in particular, who, who really has no point, but um, but who also doesn't is not a plot driver. He doesn't. He, we don't rely on the king to um, really provide a foil for our heroes and heroines. Um, and so, for me, that's always been an, imp an important part of the Darkling. And I think also this story tells you a lot about Ravka and its past. It tells you a lot about um, what life was like for the Grisha. It definitely blurs that line between science and superstition and religion, which is like my favorite line to blur. And I think when I saw some of the places that we were going in season two and knowing the way the story goes, it felt like the right time to bring out this story and to provide that context uh, for this character again. Yeah, that's amazing. I Have you watched um, Rings of Power by chance? I have not. <laughs> uh, well, when you were talking... I have not. 
Well, I, I'm not going to say this show, but recently I was watching a show and I was like, man, I hate this. And I did have a moment of being like, do I hate fantasy? Like, what <laughs> So I've had some misses lately, but I have... I have not, when I am writing, I very rarely am consuming anything that is even remotely close to what I do, right? So when I was writing Six of Crows, I was watching Parks and Rec. Like I, <laughs> I hence waffles, but like there's, I can't consume anything too close to what I am writing. I am not writing like a sort of super high epic fantasy right now, but there is magic in it. Of course there's magic in it. Um, and it just wasn't comfortable for me. I will absolutely watch it probably over the holidays. Um, but why, why did you bring it up? Just because when it shows, like I watched the Lord of the Rings movies, I never actually read them, um, all, but I, it reminded me of, you get this backstory of the way things are being built in that world. It's this huge Mm -hmm. prequel to Lord of the Rings and it's, it's incredible. It's amazing. And some of the like characters, it's the same thing that you were doing for the darkling. So I was just interesting. Yeah. So I I will definitely visit it. Um, I will be completely honest and say that Lord of the Rings is not a touchstone for me the way that it is for a lot of fantasy fans. Like I've enjoyed it, but there are a lot of things I don't like, it's just not my thing, you know, like that I'm super attached to. Same. I actually like really I've watched the movies all once. I just happened to watch the first episode and then was like, oh my I watched the season twice and made my husband watch it. Okay. Well now I am intrigued. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, because I'm not a huge again, I'm not trying to cast dispersions. It's just a question of taste. And I don't love the movies. And I I'm gonna be honest and say I don't love the books. Um, not because they're bad, just because they're not my cup of tea. Um, but now you, now that you've said that, I'm like, okay, well then maybe I will enjoy this. Just check it out. Yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. But I love a good villain, like arc where you're like, love them, hate them, mm-hmm. empathetic, terrible. <laughs> I love the back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, my, my theory on the Darkling has always been that if I had Voldemort at him, you know, like if his evil had begun to seep through his pores and he had, you know, lost his nose and whatever, you know, whatever it was, you know, like if he had vadered out, like then I think people would have been a lot less interested in um, going to the dark side. Mm-hmm. Agreed. But to me, the challenge is always to, I think that, that, <laughs> I don't think that tyrants rise to power because they are repellent. I think they rise to power because they are seductive in some way, because they know how to play on fear, because they know how to manipulate. And then the question becomes, where did they learn that? And uh, at, at whose knee did they learn to be the person that they are? And I also love writing Bagra. Oh. And I love writing the Darkling. Like He is a fun character to write because he is... He is such a plot mover. He has such, like, he is never without, like, drive to move the plot forward. And he's also very extra, which is always just a pleasure to write. You know, like, this is not a guy who ever holds back on a monologue. Um, And Bagra, I just love writing her. And it's not, I. (laughs) she's a horrible mom. Like, she's just a... (laughs) Absolutely horrible mom. But she also, you know, then you you learn her backstory in Ruin and Rising. So there's, you know, she says at one point, suffering is cheap as clay and twice as common. And this lady knows because she has suffered. But, you know, it's a question of what you do with that suffering. Does it make you somebody who recognizes suffering in others or someone who is numb to the suffering of others? So speaking of the characters, uh, how much input did you have with the illustrations of the characters? And do they represent like what you imagine them to look like? Well, now that I've seen this cosplay, <laughs> I have to provide as my whole vision for Sylvie. Yeah, um, yeah I, I was very lucky because um, Danny... I didn't communicate directly to Danny. Like they create a firewall between the illustrator and the writer to some extent. And I think that's, and I, I think that is very fair because I am a very much a perfectionist and that is not the way art should be made. Um, and I think it also provides a buffer for them um, in terms of time and in terms of feedback that I think works very well to sort of protect their creative process too. But 
Um, Danny did send me notes and I'm going to steal one of her stories because I didn't remember it and it made me laugh and laugh. Um, but apparently she was concerned because she had never written, like she had never created art specifically for young adult before. And so there's a very violent scene toward the end of the book where a very bloody thing happens, surprise. Um, and she was like, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure how far to go. I don't want to scar your readers. And I apparently wrote back in all caps, scar them. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so it was, it's just was a delight. Like she's, uh, an incredibly talented artist. Um, she brought just, I, I almost feel weird even talking about this book, um, because I feel like it is so much hers. Um, I think she did such extraordinary things in terms of setting up these pages so beautifully and making the most out of these emotional moments that exist only internally in the short story. So, um, there was a lot of back and forth and we did start with a whole character lineup and making sure we got the ages of the characters right, uh, their clothing right, and then um, moving from that into the sort of the more emotional storytelling of the world. What was what has the response been like so far of the graphic novel? So far, it's been lovely, although... I mean, I like to think that even if my readers didn't like it, they wouldn't come up to me at a con and be like, what <laughs> sucked? Um, but you never know. <laughs> uh, boundaries are ever shifting. Um, all the feedback we've gotten has been lovely. We got to do Comic-Con together, Danny and I, which was just amazing. It was the first time we've, we'd met. We had texted a lot, um, but we had never met in person. And that was just incredible. She is just an absolute joy. She's a total goth, which awesome. I did not know. <laughs> Totally took me by surprise. I got to meet her mom uh, at Yalsa in Baltimore, which was, there was this lady in the front row the whole time who was beaming. Like she had this smile on her face and I was like, wow, we must just be delightful. But it turned out it was her mom. Um, and um, yeah, so it, so far the feedback has been great. My favorite thing is that some people have bought the audio and they will listen to the audio while they flip through the art, um, which I... It didn't even occur to me that people would do, but I just love that. I think that's so cozy and wonderful. And I think it's also a great way to slow the story down because um, it's a very quick read if you're just sort of skimming through the art. And I think you do miss things and details. So I love it. Yes, I agree. And I'm going to go and I actually pointed that out to I got the audiobook and got them at the same time. And I remember like midnight when it came out, I know, mon like early Tuesday morning, I was listening to it and reading it. And it is, I tell people that if you're only reading it without the audiobook, you're missing half the experience because <laughs> Ben Barnes reads yes. parts that are not included in the graphic novel. It's, I'm, those are parts probably from, I'm guessing from the original, like from when you first wrote Demon in the yes. Wood. Yeah. So yeah, we we had to. The, they're different mediums, and so we there has to be more narration. Just as the um, visual elements that Danny brought to the page, they need to bring to life the internal that we cut in writing the script for the graphic novel, and we had to put some of that back so that um, an audio a, a listener could follow along without the pleasure of the um, art in front of them. Yeah, and I did. But we we just got a really lovely review and a uh, some it's called an earphones award for the um for the audiobook. I just found out today, and I texted Ben. <laughs> the first thing he said was, "Is there a trophy?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "I'm pretty sure we just get a nice pat on the back, but it's still good." Oh, you should make him a small old trophy. <laughs> I should like, like I a should. little earphone. <laughs> you win. <laughs> A golden that man deserves many trophies. He is um, one of the kindest, most generous humans ever. Um, and uh, he plays so many villains. I think people sometimes confuse him with them, but he is truly a lovely person. Oh, he seems it. And if you watch him on any socials, you can always see that he's just such a lovable guy. So he really is. He's just so good at like that straight faced lip quiver. Yeah, he's just good at being a villain. And yes. want to drag you in a corner, too. So. Wow. Well, he's got that. It's cute. <laughs> so. Um, so do you read graphic novels yourself? I do, actually. They're one of my favorite things to read when I'm on deadline. Um, uh, it's 
for me, it's separate enough from what I do. And, um, you know, the really great graphic novel writers, like, I guess I'm thinking of um, Brian K. Vaughan and like they, they go out and pretty much every page on a cliffhanger, which I feel like is such a good education uh, and thing to keep in mind when, when we're writing. Um, so yes, I, I do love to read graphic novels. I'm always looking for, I actually have a tattoo from a graphic novel. <laughs> I just forgotten until I looked at it. Um, but yes, um, I love Saga, of course, Why the Last Man. Um, I loved Lock and Key. I, there's, I know this is a family show, but there's a graphic novel oh. called Sex Criminals, um, which is not, it is not, it sounds terrible, but it is not, it is wonderful. Um, and uh, uh, Bitch Planet is one of my all-time favorites is what I have the tattoo from. I have a non-compliant tattoo. So, yeah. That's oh. awesome. And no, this is not a family show, so don't oh, feel okay. like that. Yeah, I mean, uh-uh. I mean, come on. We got slutty Sylvie over here saying she dragged Ben Barnes into a corner. So I mean, no judgments from me. Trust <laughs> me. <laughs> so real quickly on that, um, last time my son Caden um, asked a question that we asked for him, which was, "What was your favorite ice cream at that time?" and we have another question for him from him, and he loves manga. Mm. So, do you first do you read? Ma- like, I know they're kind of. I feel like they're kind of similar. Do you read manga? They are um, no, I don't. But it's interesting you mentioned that because um, Danny cited Full Metal Alchemist as one of the big, one of her big influences, and that at least I know from um, the adaptation. So, uh, that's sort of the depth of my knowledge when it comes to manga. Um, I, I, it is definitely not, it is a gap in my knowledge, but if somebody wants to make me a little list of what I should be reading, if Caden wants to send me a list of what I should be reading, I am definitely open to it. I'm sure, sure he will get on that and <laughs> I think okay. that was a... I, I, I'm dead serious. Like I, I love a reading list. I think that was a little cheer that we just heard. <laughs> That's uh, so um okay so this is a really big question that I don't know whether you'll be able to answer but you might um okay what can you tell us about Eric's father Eric's Asselina <laughs> if his father is really dead and she replies he will be and it's Bagra not only <laughs> I know I just but yeah it's Bagra. you're right you're right so the dark who's the dark one Alina, no, you're absolutely right. Um, oh, you thought I said Alina? Yeah, I did. I was like really confused. I was like, I don't remember that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he's dead. Um, he's so, dust. Apparently, he's he's dead and dust. Um, I I will be completely honest and say that that's a little story I have sort of buried in my head. But I do have this vision of Bagra just. Um, spending eons crossing continents and have just a lot of irresponsible behavior. And, uh, you know, if you've read, um, uh, language of thorns, you know, she has another kid out there. Um, yep. so Sildror, um, and I like to think that there are other like super children that she birthed, um, that are just like that, and, and that uh, the Darkling has pursued them his whole life. So I feel like that's a very weird prequel that will probably never get written, but you never know. Huh. Interesting. I love, well, Bagra's gorgeous. She's beautiful. She Ugh. And she does what she wants. She is. she is. She gets what she wants. She, you know, she has the, you know, Grisha birth control and she's, she can have a. <laughs> Um, and if you live forever, then um, human interaction has a different, I think, quality. Um, but I also think she, you know, she's an interesting character to me because I think a lot of people have tried to um, forgive the Darkling's behavior by saying that, you know, well, he had a, she had a, he had a terrible mom and he absolutely did. But um, she had a terrible mom, right. you know, and, and that is sort of the cycle that uh, many people live with. Uh, that we can't choose who our parents are or what our upbringing is. And <clears throat> and it's not just, you know, the question I always want to ask is who would this person have been, not only had they had they been raised by a different person, but in if Rod, Ravka had been kinder, you know, if her mother had been kinder, if her mother's mother had been kinder and her father, what what kind of difference might it have made? And I think the answer is always quite a lot. Um, you know, one one good person in your life can change everything. So... 
I agree. Um, yeah, not to get too dark, but that is um, something that happens in real life. I work with a not actually my daytime job is um, I work at a nonprofit that works with incarcerated individuals. And those are the stories we hear all mm-hmm. the time is if I just had the support, then uh, things would have been different for me. So that's an actual like real life issue. Yep. I think if we're lucky, people come into our lives to fill the gaps that other people were, that we're told other people are meant to fill, right? That if we are fortunate, we find, you know, the whole trope of found family is all about that, is finding the people who um, who create community around us, who make us feel valued and safe and provide the support that maybe we didn't have growing up. Uh, and that can make all the difference. And certainly for me, I think it made a huge difference in my life. I can look back at certain points where um, it's not that I was going to become like a tyrannical dictator of a nation, but where I can look back and see points where I think my life would have gone very different differently if I hadn't met the right person in that moment. Wow. Yeah. I think we can all relate. And I think with the Darkling, you definitely reading Demon in the Wood and it, it to me, it does explain his actions and what he what he does throughout the rest of the series. So I don't know. It it makes him more I don't know if it's relatable, but I understand him more. Like I understand his decision making. I mean, it it, it shows yeah. specifically in here. I mean, he he wanted a place that was safe for his kind, which is so sad. His kind. And it's just like just people. So Yes, just people. And I I think that I I've been talking a lot about Hellbent and Ninth House and the Grisha verse lately. And um and I think there's sort of a fundamental question that unites them, which is um what it takes to survive the world. You know, what it takes to survive is and and what you're willing to do and and how you let that shape you, I think is probably one of the chief operating questions of my work. And it's not something I thought about consciously, but it, we do, we sort of tell it ourselves in our stories, right? Like we, we don't realize what we're revealing, but I think that is a big question in, in all of my stories is, is what does it take to survive a place? And sometimes what it, does it take to survive a person? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's deep. Sorry. I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> I'm real deep. I'm real deep. Surprise. Uh, <laughs> whoa. Okay. Uh, so we saw, um, the Darkling's amplifier powers, um, like at the difference between, um, how we see it in the, the, the novels and it kind of changed in the graphic novel. Was there a reason for that? Uh, it doesn't change. So, okay. Well, you're okay. Okay. <laughs> Tell me out here, how do you think it changed? What did we mess up? Okay, so right, you're right. It was added to, so he does grab her hand and that's how it, it's the story, I guess it's like the added part that where it's Sylvie who's falling off of like almost falling from a hill and she grabs his hand and then this huge, you know, you wrote it, the ice thing, the ice tree happens. So right. So he, if you, I mean, he is an amplifier and so is Bagra. Um, and that's how she's able to train Alina. It's also how he's able to bring her power forth when he meets her in Shadow and Bone. Um, that's not really clear in the show. He uses that ring on her. And so there is maybe a more tenuous connection to him being an amplifier, but I make it pretty explicit that um, his bones would be very valuable to people in the trilogy. Um, and so that is definitely echoed in the story. And uh, because that's something I didn't get to explore that much, but the sort of damage it would do to you to know that you could never get that close to someone because um, you are more valuable to them potentially dead than alive. Like the same people you're trying to save. Yeah. So with that, if he can just touch someone... Um, would it be the same with the other amplifiers or it just, is it because he's such a strong Grisha? Like if, if we just jumped bareback on top of like the sea, would, <laughs> would that like <laughs> amplify um, powers as well? Um, mm, 
maybe briefly, I have to believe that intent has something to do with it as well. Um, and may, maybe emotional, uh, connection, but for instance, um, the Grisha examiner who comes to see Alina is also an amplifier. Like when they, that's why she's able to, um, basically grasp her wrist and almost bring the power forward but keep in mind too that there's almost always like a closed connection like you are so for instance mal is spoiler is the third amplifier right oh didn't know that uh, what <laughs> um sorry guys um i should probably warn people i don't know why they'd be listening to grisha cast if they haven't read the trilogy but i, um, I say the same thing so. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, Mal has touched Alina before, obviously they grew up together, but um, it's when he grasps her wrist and where he essentially forges a solid connection. Uh, he does it twice. I think he does it the first time in Siege and Storm, and then he does it again in Ruin and Rising. And so that is the kind of contact that is necessary in the same way that in the books, um, you have to, like the scales have to be forged around her wrist. She has to be wearing uh, the collar around her neck. Again, this is quite different in the show. There's this right. sort of fusing to the body, which I think is great and very visceral and just creepy as heck, yes. which I love. And disgusting. Um, I think it's just a great. It's so great. <laughs> and when I first saw that collar on her, the thing I love about it is that it makes explicit that this is an act of violation. Mm hmm that yes, he is granting her power, but it's power that he believes he can control and, and he takes her choice away in that moment. Um, and I think that that is viscerally so much more powerful when you see these bones emerging from her neck. So, good. Um, so horrible. Uh, this so gross. Of, so gross, so great. Um, but yeah, so it's not that like if he brushed up against somebody in a like buffet line, it's... <laughs> bust out their Grisha power, but there, there has to be a more um, powerful connection. So intent. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah. while we're talking about these amplifier powers, like, okay, the cut, um, yes. does that belong only to shadow summoners? That Does that belong to amplifier no. humans? What is that? That the cut can be performed by pretty much any ethereal guy. Um, and okay. Uh, yeah, it's just sort of a level up in Grisha power. It means you're able to, one, that you have um, enough natural Grisha ability and training, but also that you can um, use the cut in a, like, you basically can con concentrate your power. So, like, Zoya obviously would be able to control the cut. Like, you just need to have the training and the power to be able to do it. And there's a long sequence in Rune and Rising where Bagra tries to train Alina in using the cut, and she literally, like, lops the top of a mountain. So, um, yeah. Awesome. So, okay. Well, I was going to ask another question, but you kind of, like, the difference between, we had, like, in the show... Shadow and Bone, we got a backstory of the Darkling that was really cool that hadn't been written. Um, mm. Like, what Like, what did you think of that? Um, like, how much, like, I thought it was a really cool scene. Like, I loved it. I, I loved seeing that. Um, I'm, I guess I'm just asking, what did you think of that? Was that something you wrote? Is it something that came, they came up with? It is definitely something they came up with um, and that I thankfully got to weigh in on. Um, for me, there's always going to be a little bit of discomfort in, um, you know, love interest gets fridged in order for, for hero or villain or anyone to level up. So that's always a little uneasy for me. That said, the thing that was important, I thought, was not just to show the origins of the fold, but also to show his humanity and his development. And it's something Ben and I talked about a lot. If you notice, his costume is different. There's a vulnerability to him. He's younger. He shaved for it, you know, and, and he looks much more baby faced. And um, and I think you can really see a, a major step in him becoming um who becoming the darkling essentially yeah. and i thought that was pretty important uh to the show we did talk about doing 
Demon in the Wood as sort of a separate episode, but it would be wildly expensive because of the special effects. And it's all kid actors, which is super challenging. Um, there are all kinds of rules that govern how long uh, young people can be on set, um, the kind of stunts they can be asked to do, all kinds of things. And it was just too tricky, uh, especially because we were on a very tight budget and a very tight shoot. But, you know, maybe someday. Oh, my God. Well, I think it was phenomenal. I can't wait to see what season two has in store. <laughs> okay, and- season two, I cannot say very much about, but I will say it is packed. Like, it is packed stuff. Like, it is so much action, so much stuff happening. Like, it is wild, wild ride. Oh, okay. <laughs> we are so excited because we've dissected, like, what, where it could go. You know, I mean... We really have, because, I mean, you've got the Six of Crows story, and then you've got, we just finished Shadow and Bone. So it's like, are we going to go to Siege and Storm? And then how are we going to connect Six of Crows? And it's like, oh. I mean, all I can say is that you're going to get a lot of scenes from the books, but you are also going to get some, it's going to be like season one, where you're going to get some unexpected um interactions you're going to get some new stuff so that even if you know the books inside and out you're going to get to be surprised which i think is one of the best right. things about the show like and um and also again they pulled from very unexpected sources and did some very cool things with them and that was sort of amazing for me because i've been very lucky to have writers who care so much about the material and who dive into it and the way that they picked up on small things was just wild. So if you have read The Lives of Saints, if you have read the trilogy and the duology, um, you're going to be, you're going to be way ahead of the game on a lot of things. You're going to be like, wait a minute. I know that character. So (laughs) it's, um, it is just, I was so surprised and so delighted with so many of the things they did. But I will also say I have not watched the final episodes because I never do. I watch the rough cuts um, and I I read the scripts. I give notes. I read the revisions. I give notes. I watch the rough cuts and then I let go because it's and I st- took a big step back in season two. I was not as involved in, as in season one um, because I had books to write and they would never get written if I stayed. <laughs> no, I truly, I would never. It's, you know, television is. um I talk a lot about revision when it comes to novels, but television is a different kind of revision. And, um, you know, to read eight, uh, you know, an eight episode season, to read those scripts again and again and again, every every version of them, to um, offer your suggestions, to read every single email, to watch every single cut. Um, it's, I, I think, an incredible thing, but it is also not my job. Um, like my, I, I don't actually get paid to do all of that. So, um, and I, but more importantly, like my dream job is writing books and I don't want to lose that job. Like I would like to keep doing that job. So, uh, it did require that I sort of take a step back and just trust them. And also it's a different beast now. It's, it's not mine anymore. It belongs to them and it belongs to the audience. So were you on set as much as you were the first season? Um, I only did one set visit this time around, but it was a long and I did not do another cameo. (laughs) I know. If we get a season three, I am definitely going to demand to be a villager who dies horribly. Uh, (laughs) That is my all time dream is to just be like have a really dramatic death scene. (laughs) But um, a violent death. A violent, bloody death. Hopefully by a mulgra. I'd love to be torn apart by a mulgra. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know, I'm over um, But, yes, uh, so I got to be on set. I got to meet all of our new actors. I got to meet Danny and oh. Callahan. I had not met Danielle and Callahan. Um, like, all th- because it was all pandemic stuff. Mm-hmm. I wasn't there when they were shooting. And then we thought, oh, we're going to get to do all this promotion together. We didn't. We had to do all of our press junkets and everything over Zoom. And uh, we never got like a premiere. We never got to do any of that fun stuff. So it was an absolute joy to meet them. Um, we had a wonderful dinner my last night there um, where I just got to hang out with everybody. And 
Lewis and Anna and Patrick. And it was just, and of course, Jack and and sweet Jack who's playing Wylan. Um, And it was just really a wonderful thing. They are a truly kind and lovely group of people. All of the joy you see in them when they're together is real. The fact that they hang out together, like that they find ways to hang out together when they're not shooting, like all of that is real. Like it's all just incredibly magical. And I feel like we got so lucky to have a cast that big that is that caring and that unselfish and that delightful. Like what were the chances? Oh, it's so special. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> they are special. They are special angel babies and I love them. Oh. Okay, we're going to take it back to like where we left off in the last interview we had. Um, so we're going to take it back to rr 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 um, <laughs> What does the title Rule of Wolves mean to you? We have had so many discussions about this, about what we each think, and a lot of our listeners... Um, have also discussed it too. So what does that title mean to you? I mean, much like Hellbent, it can mean many things. That's Ooh. my, that's Ooh. the kind of title I like. Um, so yeah, it can be perceived as like a rule as in um, the way that the Fjordans govern. And, um, you know, so one of my favorite lines in the book is um, my places with the wolves. And because it's used as a kind of insult against Hannah, but it becomes a kind of, um, it's something that that uh, they and Nina really uh, like latch onto. And it becomes, and for me, it was like that, finding my place among the wolves <laughs> for me in life was very much finding my people, finding yes. the person that I loved. Uh, finding myself and find and not caring, you know, <laughs> when they said, when they would say that Hannah, you know, oh, her places were the wolves. It meant she doesn't quite fit. She's not quite right here. Right. She doesn't quite follow the rules. So the rule of wolves was that part of it. And also the danger of feared and dominance is a real threat in the book. So that is also, you know, the idea of the reign of wolves um, uh, and what it would mean to, for Fjorda to take control of Ravka um, is very much one of the operating principles of the book. Well, that's amazing. And I think it goes along with a lot of what Everybody has their own interpretations, but at the same time, I think they all connect too. So, yeah. um, question, how long have you known that the Darkling was going to come back? And, <laughs> and with that, how you can is- blame Holly Black for that. <laughs> she oh. was like, he's not really dead. And I was like, nah, he's not really dead. I mean, if you, if you read that final scene in Rune and Rising, there's a lot of ambiguity built in there because if you because if you notice the soldier who's next to him has been tailored to look like Alina. Mm-hmm. And so that should raise the question if you're a careful reader of, well, could oh. anything have been done to no. remember? Because Ruby is on the pyre, not Alina, obviously. Right. So that should raise a little question. Well, if one person has been tailored, why couldn't the other person be tailored too? So that for me was my way of leaving the door open. Um, And he's just, I had some misgivings about it, but he's so much fun to write. And I felt like so many characters needed a moment to like have it out with them too. So I think that was part of it. But I know, I look, when Rule of Wolves came out, um, some Darkling fans were very angry at me. They review bombed me. You know, oh. they came to me on Twitter. No, it's it's it happens. That's the nature of putting work out into the world, and uh, it hurt. Like I'm not going to say that wasn't a painful or uncomfortable thing because you want to make every reader happy, but that is impossible. Yeah, right? it's mm-hmm. impossible, and it should never be the goal of a writer or an artist to make everybody happy because that's the way you make really shitty art so my great joy was then watching <laughs> the rule of wolves good read score just go <laughs> um and the actual readers got their hands on it and it is thankfully one of my better reviewed books and that means a lot to me because at least for a while that's going to be the last thing i write in the grisha verse i do have a plan for something else i'm actually um going to be working with a co-writer on something else um that i'm very excited about but you know i had every intention of 
writing a third six of crows book and obviously rule of wolves sets that up yep mm-hmm. um but then the show came out and things got really noisy and it became very hard for me to sort of create within that world in the way that I had intended to. So I decided I wanted to take a step back and maybe someday I'll write that book, um, you know, when the story starts speaking. But I also didn't want to just keep creating Grisha verse books for the sake of doing that, you know? Absolutely. Like, um, and... I will say that, you know, my publisher made it clear. They were like, would you like a lot of money? And I was like, I love money. <laughs> Much like he has, I love money. But I also don't want to write that. Like, those characters are very precious to me. And I don't want to write that book until I'm ready to write it. And I don't think readers want me to write that book until I'm ready to write it. And I have a, a lot of story that's lined up. And even today, I was doing the dishes. And all of a sudden, I was, like, envisioning this very clear scene. And I was like, okay, write down the notes. Um, and and put them aside and maybe one day that will become a thing. But um, for me, there are other sort of places in the Grisha verse that feel more like offshoots that I would like to explore rather than sort of following that particular path. And, um, you know, right now I'm not in danger of the show catching up too much to <laughs> they still have a lot of books to cover before before I'm in a George R. R. Martin situation. So Right. I, I'm I feel comfortable. Ninth house is different. Ninth house, I'm like, I gotta get to the book. Like, what's the uh, but you know, because there's just less runway on that one. So yeah. Well, Before we get to hell bit quickly, right. I want to say in the last interview, we asked you if there would be a trans character, and you were super sneaky. And you were like, Yeah, you know, in the future, totally. And then Ro 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 came out. <laughs> and then we have Hana, and we were like, oh, sneaky, sneaky. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't want to play my hand. And I will also say, too, that um, I did have um, uh, two trans sen- uh, sensitivity or authenticity readers. I don't like the phrase sensitivity reader because mm-hmm. it sounds like emotional sunburn, but authenticity. <laughs> and both of them felt that Hana was gender fluid um, as opposed to being strictly trans. So that is the way that I describe them. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, but I would also say that if there are trans readers out there that need Hannah to be trans, Hannah can be trans. Right. Yeah. Hannah's whatever Hannah is to you. And I'm just going to say this last thing about Rule of Wolves because we were so excited about it. But oh my God, the scene when like my girl Zoya becomes queen (laughs) and her outfit, I will not die until I get to see what that actually looks like. So they better get up. Like, I want to see that actually in person. Like, I just... I just I, say that Sujaya, who has been doing Shantaram, I don't know if you've seen any of the publicity from that or the stills they released from it, and her hair is all wavy, and she looks so beautiful, and I'm like, oh, my queen! Like, it just makes me so happy. She's so gorgeous and um, such a wonderful actress, and I just... Yes, I hope I hope one day we get to see that. That would be amazing. And I will not lie, um, designing her like <laughs> royal ascension dress was really fun. Like I just oh my gosh, yes. love a good gown. So yeah. yeah. And my characters so rarely get that moment. They are so frequently in peril or slogging through mud or, you know, on the streets of Ketterdam that it's like, I just want, I was like, you just love something pretty. Everybody should have something beautiful to wear. Oh my God. It's beautiful, and it's also, like, it's punk. I feel like it's just it's, it's so much because it's got the dragon scale. I mean, I'm I'm all for it. I mean, I actually have considered trying to try. I wanted to, like, possibly try to dress up like that, but where would I even begin? I don't even know how. That was I, an intense one. That, is, that and the dragon scale armor probably, like, require a lot of, a lot of, um, of building. But yeah. I used to make my Halloween co- costumes with a hot glue gun, so just saying, anything is possible. Okay. Yeah. We're going to talk about Hellbent now. We are. We have to talk about Hellbent. <laughs> we have to talk about <laughs> Hellbent. Um, so it cannot be a coincidence, I think, that Darlington is swallowed by a hell beast alex mm-hmm. says they're going to hell and that the mm-hmm. title is hellbent right oh, mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. <laughs> are you drinking a cup all of i'll tea? say is that at one point one of the characters uh shouts hell heist and that is pretty much what's happening in this book oh, so hell heist uh, that is awesome. yeah i didn't i didn't feel like i could 
write this book without taking like you can't tell people you're gonna go to hell and then not go to hell but I will say that um I wanted I gave myself a little challenge because I I didn't want to do the kind of judeo-christian um you know I don't know if you watch Sandman but the sort of like teeming with demons hell which is fine like and it has like there's a reason we're terrified of that and like that it that it like you know Constantine hell hellblazer etc but like I wanted to do my own version of uh hell and demons and create my own lore and that was actually really fun for me um sounds exciting if you read Ninth House, you know that I love lore, I love ephemera, I love history, I love mushing together real history with um, the occult. And so that was, for me, one of the most pleasurable things about, was reading a lot about sort of theories of hell and um, theories of hell before we had Christianity. You know, there were a lot of ideas about hell before that, um, ideas about portals to hell and passages to hell that some people still believe exist in the world, um, the origins of Samhain, like there's a lot of there's a lot of cooking that went there's a lot of stuff that went into the crock pot to cook for this book and there's a reason it took three years to write part of that is the show um but part of it is also that these books are so much more dense with lore than um I guess the Grisha verse I'm always just making up the lore right. so yeah research yeah that's incredible does that make it more difficult because you're adding in not necessarily like real life things but that you're having to research more and that you're you're not just making everything up i mean look i do a lot of research for the grishaverse books too because i think that's what lends authenticity and weight to a world you know that 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 you and it's something i tell writers all of the time when they ask me about world building is if you're going to write about a dictator you have to research dictatorships if you're going to write about farming you have to research farms you know i i i i've read you know books or something they'll be talking about like you know oh uh you know we had we had we had beef for dinner but we were so poor and i'm like you're not poor you're right. eating for dinner, you know, or they'll be like, oh, I went and tended to the horses. And I'm like, horses are fucking, ex- sorry, swearing, um, expensive, yeah. but so expensive. Like the upkeep of livestock is expensive. Like you have to actually know these things because readers sense, even if they don't know about farming or they have not lived under hopefully a tyrannical reign, like you have to know the history of those things. It will make your writing richer. But Ninth House is different because um, these are real places in a real city, and it was really important to me that you be able to, that the line between reality and fantasy get very blurred. Um, and that means having, I want to say verisimilitude, but I don't know how to pronounce it, but having, <laughs> having that um, where you can look these places up, where you can walk that map that we have in the front of the book. And find all of those places. That is so important to me. And and the fact that so much of the history that I quote in Ninth House is real. The skeleton in the root of the trees that came up during Hurricane Sandy is real. Okay. Like all of the, the bodies still buried in the New Haven Green, real. The taxidermied animals buried in the Rosenfeld basement, real. Like every time you think, like I was reading some article the other day and they were like, a man was, you know, we just, they had discovered this tomb where a man had been buried uh, and then uh, they had, he had been unearthed and he had clearly been buried again with his skull and his limbs in the shape of a cross, uh, which as you know, is how you keep vampires from rising. And I was like, I bet this was in Connecticut. And sure enough, yes, it was. <laughs> like, wow. Connecticut, it's Weird. And New Haven is the weirdest of towns. Like there's so much strange history there that people just don't know about. And for me, that play, that the things that actually played out there for good and evil, and some of it is some very real human evil, um, you know, learning about the legacy of slavery and the Ivies, you know, making sure that that was addressed with, I hope, sensitivity. Like these are things that you know, the real human monsters are often much worse than the monsters I invent, but that is also part of the tension in the book, is understanding magic is just another kind of power that can be abused and hoarded. Mm-hmm. And that, for me, is also very important. Wow. Ninth House was an amazing read for me, I remember. And also, it's actually an amazing connection that I have with you, because that's when I got to meet you. And I was really <laughs> nervous when I came, but I was so excited. And 
also, that is the first... I'm not a fast reader. I'm actually a very slow reader. Um, but I read that book in three days, which is extremely oh. fast for me, um, and gobbled it up. And it was just so amazing. And I loved... I love that we've got more coming. And um, Alex is such a cool character. And I I love the just... I know that she's not practicing Judaism, but I love that she she is. And like, I mean, like, because her because her mother is right. Or am I confused? Not her grandma. Her mom, her grandma. Yeah. Look, for me, Alex is very closely connected to me in the sense that, um, you know, I am not a practicing Jew, but I am sort of keenly aware of the fact that the world sees me as a Jew and that my cultural history is Jewish. And I have Sephardic history on, you know, one side of me is Russian and Lithuanian and one side of me is um, Sephardic from Spain and Morocco. And that is, you know, that sort of cultural legacy and those ancestors mean a lot to me and are actually deeply connected to the work I'm working on right now. And sometimes it's a little eerie, like I get a little feeling that somebody is trying to talk to me, um, make those connections. And I, it's up to me to listen to them. But Alex is someone who is so vulnerable because she's been so disconnected from her culture. Yep. You know, she doesn't, her, her, the culture of her father, she has no connection to because she has no connection to him. Same with me and the culture of her mother, sorry. And the culture of her mother, um, she's been disconnected from because her mother is herself disconnected from that and has kind of replaced uh, her own history and legacy with um, a lot of uh, new age religion and a lot of um, MLMs and quick fixes. And um, this, this hunger that I think we all do share for spirituality and connection and ritual. So I feel very close to Alex, although boy, is she tougher than I am. <laughs> and she is, she is, but I feel like there's like a direct through line and the appeal of somebody like the Darkling, somebody like Kaz, somebody like Alex, because they do, you never know how far they'll go. And that is fun to write and terrifying, I think, for other characters to encounter. And you sense that, in, in especially in Dawes. And Dawes even says in Hellbent at one point, like, Darlington didn't seem to realize how dangerous this girl was, but Dawes sees it. Dawes observes it. Oh, so I know that we've got Hellbent coming, and <laughs> but I mean, is there is there more story than after Hellbent? You think maybe that I mean? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, hilariously, my my original plan was like I'm gonna write twelve books in this series. I wanted it to be like a detective series, and then I was like, okay, maybe five. And now I'm like, there will be three. <laughs> There will be three. This is a trilogy. There will be three. But I will tell you, so much happens in book two. I did not hold back. And I think for me, actually, I realized something. And this is a scary thing to admit, but I, I'm going to I'm gonna admit it to you, which is that if I know too much about where I'm going, I think the writing becomes static. And I know there are writers who work very well sort of in long form series like I remember hearing that like Brandon Sanderson had planned the whole like 36 book Cosmere or whatever when he was like 17. I am never going to be a writer. And something that I realized is I actually like that sense of free fall at the end of a book. I know some big things that will happen in that third novel, especially now that the second book is written. Um, and that allows me to at least build uh breadcrumbs in if people want to follow them and and I know I know where it ends I know all of that but there are things big gaps that I don't know about book three and that was true for Crooked Kingdom it was true for Rule of Wolves and I think it makes for better books <laughs> for me for me it makes books. yeah because then it's like I, it's terrifying, right? Like you truly like, oh, here's a cliffhanger and I'm going to throw myself over this cliff with all the rest of you. But I also think it's the same way that I've learned this now that TV writers, when they end a season, they have no idea where they're going. They don't know. And it's like, that actually forces them, I think, into tremendous creativity because you've painted yourself into a corner. Now it's time to figure out your way out. It's like, oh, the heist has gone wrong. Now you got to make a new plan. And I think that that, for me, is a very exciting part of writing these books. Oh, that is so exciting. We we can't wait. So let's re as we're uh, heading out, let's remind everybody when to expect Hellbent to come out. Okay, Hellbent comes out on January 10th. 
Um, I'm going on tour then. Please check my Instagram. Please come see me. January is such a weird month to be bringing a book out in. Like, I'm so scared people are just going to be like, they're going to be hung over from New Year's for 10 days. And they're not going to remember. <laughs> Um, but we're going to have lots of promo stuff happening too. And I'm going to do like a 10 day countdown. I haven't quite figured out what we're going to do yet. So if people have ideas, let me know. Um, but, uh, we're going to, I'm going to have one night. We're going to, I'm going to make, uh, Av- uh, Avgo Limono, which is the soup that Dawes makes for Darlington. Cause I love it. It's one of my favorite things. Um, I'm going to do, uh, like a little talk about, um, some of the historical places at Yale and uh, my connection to them. I'm going to do some giveaways. We're going to have um, some very beautiful stuff that we're going to be releasing, um, including the pre-order print, which is beautiful. I just saw it. It has gold foil on it. It's gorgeous. Oh um, but yes, please, everybody come see me. I'm tour. I haven't been on tour in so long and I am super. It's always like you're throwing a birthday party and you're just like, no one's going to come. So please oh. see me. Oh my God. Um, yes. And yeah, and please pre-order. It means the world when people pre-order. So please get out there and pre-order. Well, hopefully you'll come to Nashville. Yes, <laughs> next time. I know you didn't get to make it this one, but it's okay because I still have. I do, I, I do love Nashville. I really do. Yeah, and remember, I have to serve you bananaless pudding. <laughs> oh, yes, I will have the bananaless pudding as long exactly. as there's no banana near it. There's yes. no banana. No, it's going to be delicious. It's going to be vanilla pudding. I I Thank still you. remember that. So yes. <laughs> it'll actually be pretty tasty. I'm sure my son actually will eat it because he doesn't bi- like bananas either. So that is because Hayden is wise. That is a wise child. All right. He, he, yeah. You guys have a connection. So bananas are the devil's fruit. So <laughs> <laughs> put that in hell bent. <laughs> yes. Maybe that's what. Oh, that'd be great. Or maybe that's a great amplifier. For <laughs> <some reason. laughs> I know. I love the idea. That is just getting too weird. <laughs> we are. Well, thank you right. so much for joining us. This has been a pleasure. And um, yeah, we you can't both. wait. Thank you for doing this podcast. Thank you to everybody who listens. Thank you to everybody who buys the books. I am so grateful. I love getting to do this for a living. And I am just very, very thankful. So thank you so much. And thank you both for being just delightful and wearing those incredible costumes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we thank love you. Thank you for Lee. appreciating. <laughs> you too. All right. Bye. Oh my God, girl. The time goes by so fast. Yes, it does. That was so much fun. Oh, she's amazing. Yes, absolutely. I'm breathless. <laughs> so remember January to check out Hellbit. Yep. January 10th. Mm-hmm. It is so exciting. And we're excited because one we we finished 9000 we can't wait for the next and also oh my god i think that's also the same day that a holly black book comes out which is like one of her really good friends mm-hmm. so um yes make sure and do all the pre-orders because they look phenomenal and they really do like yeah. some of the like it's beautiful the different editions are just amazing yeah and target's got one mhm that's amazing yeah go target so, um, also, surprise, sorry we didn't um, do Demon in the Wood graphic novel this week, but we figured, you know, this would kind of take priority. Oh, yeah. So, um, don't worry. We'll be back next week to cover Demon in the Wood graphic novel. And now we all have this extra juicy info about it. So, um, make sure to listen to the audiobook and read it. And we'll be covering it. Okay. Well, anyways, that's it, girl. So, I love you, and we love you all. Long live the Grishaverse. Like, we're at the end of the hour, so my voice is a little husky. It was. No mourners. No funerals. This has been GrishaCast. Connect with us on the web at GrishaCast.com. Send an email to info at GrishaCast.com. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and please, please, please check us out on YouTube at GrishaCast. And thank you to our amazing staff, Chris, Michelle, Alex, and Brenda. 